Hello friends, uh, I'm finally back after nearly two months. Uh, can't really uh, tell you exactly <laughs> why it's taken this long, apart from the fact, and I, it's probably a complaint I've already made, that the subject is so large I get lost in it. Uh, I perhaps in some ways get confused by all of the possible details that one could dive into, but I just want to sort of regather uh, myself and the vision of this series and say that my desire is, is above everything else. My desire <clears throat> is, to, is to create an environment, if you will, that will make it possible that the Holy Spirit might reveal to us all more deeply and profoundly just how big our Jesus really is. And I think that that's really one of the, the, the main issues that, uh, that's confronting the church today. And we really need, it is my belief, we really do need to get, get back to uh, understanding and appreciating what Paul means by the mystery of Christ. I think it's at the very core of Paul's theology. Uh, it is the, the linchpin, the axial uh, center of everything that Paul says. I, I genuinely believe that. Um, it, it lies beneath it if it's not on the surface. Sometimes, as uh, 1 Corinthians 2 demonstrates, sometimes Paul is speaking in a way that uh, does not divulge the, the deeper things of God, as he puts it in 1 Corinthians 2, uh, but that this mystery uh, is, uh, and, and the wisdom hidden in this mystery for the ages, is something that Paul did make accessible and did give us more information about, which I think, uh, as far as my understanding is, is concerned, is found perhaps perhaps in its richest form in uh, Colossians chapter 1. So in a way, this is just a further exploration of Colossians 1 of, and of, of all the things that uh, are implicit in it. And of course, it's like genuinely the whole cosmos is implicit in Colossians 1. Uh, and... But, but Paul zooms out, recontextualizes his, his, the revelation he's received about Jesus Christ and puts it in this larger cosmic frame. Uh, he presents us with the deep mystery of what lies beneath the, in, in some respects, the, the highest moment of Christ's life is his death. And then beyond that, uh, uh, inseparable from it is, of course, his resurrection, apart from which his death would have left us as, uh, as those who have no hope, uh, as those who are to be the most pitied of all. Uh, so we, we die, we, we're going to go deeper. I, I, I can't explain why my mind goes in the directions that it does sometimes. I hope and pray it is somehow the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I know my reception of that guidance, my response to it is not inerrant or infallible. So uh, I implore you always to test and try uh, and improve and to hold fast to what is good in, in, in anything I say. And uh, it's, it's like the old saying, uh, spit out the bones and chew on the meat. So, but anyway, returning to... Uh, what uh, I, I at least began to uh, uh, talk about in previous videos um, is that 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 were that when when New Testament scholars look at Paul in and his language, especially in Colossians and Ephesians, they see cosmology written all over the place, and so I think this is why there's a kind of resonance that just immediately comes to my mind, having read and loved C.S. Lewis for so many years is just how taken Lewis was with cosmology. Um, 
And so, uh, you know, again, uh, two books come to mind that attest to this so completely, and one is The Discarded Image by C.S. Lewis, and, of course, the other uh, book that I've recommended, and I do recommend so highly, is uh, Planet Narnia by Michael Ward, perhaps one of the greatest books ever written about C.S. Lewis and the underlying and hidden message <clears throat> and cosmological framework, I would say, of the Chronicles of Narnia. But when we're looking at cosmology, we're at least in modern terminology and conceptions, we're automatically thinking about physics. And so the language that uh, that I think physics in, a, in some respects borrows from metaphysics and, and from even the ancient conceptions and cosmologies and models of the universe are especially these three things. There are forces, there are elements, and there are laws. Uh, so uh, again, modern examples, gravitational field, uh, uh, modern examples of elements, the periodic table, easy enough, and then of course laws. We perhaps would immediately think of the law of gravity, something that we have been exploring since the early days of the Enlightenment, since Isaac Newton especially, and the uh, great uh, revolution, if you will, in science that began to take place with the realization of these things. Uh, and in some sense, the canonization of these particular concepts. But again, I think they're rooted and grounded in something far more ancient and something that, that uh, in, in a modern conception would transgress the limitation and the reductionism of modern science or scientism. Uh, but in the ancient days, there were also, cosmologically, there were forces. There were principalities and powers that were at work within the universe. And uh, I think this is probably one of the key areas that, that we just don't understand very well. And, and we, 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 have, we don't have a lot of information, data, if you will, on the surface of things, like typically in Paul's letters. I believe there are certain presuppositions and assumptions, worldviews, that are going on beneath the surface of Paul's letters that because we don't live in Paul's day we, and we don't have Paul's mind exactly, uh, we, we are, can, can easily misconstrue what Paul is really trying to communicate and therefore our hermeneutical approach can fail. So I think we need to reappreciate, and I think that some of, the, some of the books that I'm reading right now try to get into the detail of what were the cosmological views of Paul's day and to which Paul was exposed. We know Paul was a, was a widely read man, uh, or, or at least educated in a somewhat broad way that went beyond simply the Old Testament. I think that's been one of the errors throughout the history of the churches. We've tried to say, oh, well, Paul is a devout uh, you know, believer even if in Old Testament terms, and therefore he stuck only to the Masoretic text of the Old Testament, and that's a gross misconception. And we understand now that that Paul had a, a, a much broader exposure uh, to the Hellenistic thought of his own day, especially, and that these things, I think, providentially. Uh, uh, fed into the imagination of Paul. And I don't mean by that just some sort of speculative crazy idea in terms of imagination, but what I mean is that how God has given us these imaginations so that we in a, some sort of uh, uh, hopeful and heuristic sense can explore the possibilities and the Spirit of God can come in in that all of that process and inspire us and lead us and guide us into to thinking bigger and bigger ideas about who God is and who Christ is. And to me, there's, there's no cap on that. He, 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 it goes beyond, uh, as Paul says, beyond uh, knowledge. His love goes beyond that we might know the love that surpasses knowledge and the power that goes beyond imagination. So 
I, I think there's a very positive sense in which God, who has given us this imagination, can use it as, especially such authors as Lewis, as George MacDonald, as so many numerable other uh, authors, Tolkien, etc., have through the imagination given us uh, better perspectives, perhaps in a somewhat mythological form, but better perspectives on what really is the truth of reality. So, but anyway, the ancient conceptions about, for instance, forces are, are the principalities and powers, but with elements, it's fascinating. And again, I think you have to dig deeper into extra biblical literature, and many scholars have helped us all out by doing that work for us. But the elements, <clears throat> it's a word that Paul uses at least in, uh, I think, Colossians and Galatians, the stoichia, uh, the bit which can be translated the ABCs, it can be translated elements, it can be translated building blocks, uh, but, it, but it, it's sort of a very um, physics-oriented uh, and key word that speaks about what's the, what is the stuff of, of the natural world made of at its very most fundamental levels. The only thing that's different, though, here, especially in Paul's thinking, is that these stoichia are not just inanimate uh, objects or inanimate matter, uh, like we may tend to think of carbon and hydrogen and nitrogen, etc., but that these were the fundamental elements out of which the natural material world are made, but they have this, they have a more personal side. They have agency, and they seem to be re closely related, if not identical in some way, with uh, what we would consider the angelic world. Uh, perhaps inclusive of the fallen angelic world. But, but with these forces, and this is kind of the way I see it. I didn't create a, an image for this, but just imagine in your own mind a large circle, and within that circle, that circle contains everything in the cosmos. Inside it, just picture many different eras, and these eras are what I think physicists would call vectors of force. But they're pointing in all sorts of different directions. And, and what I believe, to, to sort of j jump to the chase, uh, uh, is, that, is that it's clear in Scripture that God's, God purposes in His one great and grand purpose. The telos, the end, where, the, where all of creation is heading, headed is to realign all these forces so that they are submitted to him and to his headship. And he brings about a unification of all things, a recapitulation of all things, as Paul talks about in Ephesians 1. So, but, it's, but it's while we're living this life, we're living in the midst of these many and various forces, both good and evil. And interestingly enough, I like to add this footnote that, that uh, Lewis in... Uh, in the discarded, excuse me, the discarded image talks about the longevi, which I'm probably mispronouncing, but it, what's fascinating there is Lewis seems to think that, that it's not just a binary. There aren't just fallen angels and non-fallen angels, but that there is something of a spectrum between the two, and that this was somewhat part of some of the medieval conceptions of these long livers uh, who were manifested in everything from uh, leprechauns to ghosts, uh, etc., and just about naiads, dryads, etc., uh, I think were included under this huge rubric. But, but the, the point here being that th there are many agencies that, that, are, that are living and moving and having their being in this cosmos, and some of them are absolutely in rebellion against God, but some are more somewhat maybe toward the middle. They're more like tricksters, and they have perhaps, you could say, a sense of humor in terms of their interaction with humanity. Uh, I know that's all kind of an aside, and I probably shouldn't even brought it up, but this is where my mind's going. But it's interesting to me because I, I think 
tendency of, of most of us Christians is we tend to think in black and white. We tend to think in binary. And uh, we miss the paradoxes, the parables, and the enigmas that this created world is filled with. And uh, so uh, what we need to do is not necessarily understand the nature of all these varied forces. What we need to do is to fix our eyes on the North Star, as it were, and that is Jesus Christ, the one who, who is uh, redeeming and who is reordering uh, restoring, renewing, reconciling all that is within this cosmic circle, which I believe Paul says in some way is actually his body. And we'll get into that later. Don't dismiss that as just heretical nonsense. Uh, I believe there's good reason to think that creation is rightly understood uh, his body in the larger cosmic sense of the word. I'm not denying that he had his own physical body, that it was crucified, it died, it rose again, and it ascended into heaven. So, so don't, don't, don't think I'm denying that or uh, downplaying it whatsoever in any way. But then, of course, there are the laws. And the laws are, the thing you have to keep in mind here is is maybe that the laws are a description of uh, of um, of habit. I'm trying to think of the guy's name. Uh, oh, who um, is very very uh, insightful on this matter. But uh, anyway, I'll probably have to edit this part out. Um, okay. The next thing is the laws of gravity. And we have to see the dynamism between these three uh, categories. That the forces and the elements and the laws are all interrelated. And the, that the laws uh, that are either created or are manifested by way of these forces there are certain laws that are, in a, in a sense, generated out of these forces and they're manifesting these elemental spirits in the world. And so, therefore, even though I can't necessarily explain that because I probably don't understand it, but it seems to be very implicit in what Paul is saying in Galatians, that Paul will go on to talk about the law not only as it relates to the law given through the angels, the, the Ten Commandments, for instance, but also he moves on from that to talk about the stoichia. So he enlarges the idea of the law. He expands it in such a way that now it encompasses, I think, the law, even in some wonderfully weird but true way, the laws of the universe. Um, and that and that through the reverencing of these forces, in other words, as they're manifested perhaps through various planetary forces, like and, and therefore the worship of these gods with the little g, the Roman gods and the Greek gods, who are exemplified in some ways through uh, Mercury, Jupiter, Mars, etc., that as one enters into relationship with these forces, they are, in some sense, ultimately entangled and even enslaved in terms of ritual observance, festival days, certain rites that are to be performed, etc. And so, Paul, it's just interesting to me, and kind of it's kind of mind blowing. And, and but I think if you read Paul closely in Galatians, that is what he's doing. Uh, he he's not just confining himself to the Jewish laws, to the observance of Jewish commandments to dietary laws, etc., but he even expands it out and said there's something even larger that's going on here. And it is, again, all, the, all of this chaos, if you will, that's going on since the fall of creation and that Christ is committed to bringing all things into subjection unto himself and to reordering and reordering all these 
various forces, vector forces, spiritually vector forces in the universe. And he's bringing it all back together. And even in, I believe, a surpassing way. It's kind of like a when a bone is broken, when it heals, it's even stronger. And so I think as Christ redeems the creation that is in, by, and for him, that is going to be tr- stronger. It's going to be even uh, more glorious and that the glory will, in a sense, be unending in terms of its unfolding over space and time as this is revealed further and further under his lordship. But, but we see again, we see all of this uh, uh, in one way or another touched upon by C.S. Lewis and the medieval cosmology that, uh, that he's engaged in uh, in the discarded image and also in just about everything that Lewis wrote. There's something about this cosmology that's going on. Something has gone wrong with the cosmos. I'm a little late. But I did, I did forget to mention this word entropy, which uh, I believe is uh, that everything moves toward decay. Everything in this universe as it is as it stands right now moves toward decay and toward death Um, so uh, what I want to talk about today in the maybe nine minutes I hope I can get it done in nine minutes is Aslan's crucifixion what Lewis got profoundly right and how the cross and cosmology even in the fictional world of C.S. Lewis are going together because his analogy to the cross is obviously uh, Aslan's death death on behalf of uh, Edmund. So uh, let's just look for a moment at some of the things that, that, that you might not catch if you're reading the line, the witch, the wardrobe, but which again to me are just undeniable. Uh, Lewis, for instance, talks in, his, in, in Aslan's dialogue with the White Witch. This conversation, this language comes up about deep magic and then about a deeper magic still uh, from before time began. Now, I believe that the word magic is just uh, Lewis's placeholder, uh, in a sense a more accessible word, an, an imaginative play, if you will, on the idea of what of what of spiritual truth and reality, uh, one could even say philosophically of metaphysical truth. It's not only how the the world works uh, in terms of our our observation and our accounting of the facts that we can observe, but it's how does it work beneath the covers? What's going on beneath? of the law of gravity, for instance. We could describe the law of gravity, we can calculate it, but what physicists really want to know is what's going on, what's causing it, what is really genuinely the source of what we observe and call the law of gravity. Uh, And so, so to me, uh, this is very parallel. Lewis, I think consciously, is drawing this and using this metaphorical term of magic to speak about the deep things of God's wisdom hidden in the mystery from before the ages. Uh, And this mystery is tied throughout and with all of creation. Uh, uh, And I guess I'm making that point. I haven't even looked at these notes in a while, so it's like, why did I write that down? But anyway, I think the major thing here is that we just have to stop divorcing Christ from creation. Christ is not, here again, I, I should have maybe made an illustration, but just again, easily think of it. Think of a little circle up here, maybe a big circle, it doesn't matter, but a circle at the top, and inside of it right Christ, and then a circle at the bottom inside of it right creation. Uh, I think in some ways implicitly, this is how Christians think about creation. They think about Christ as above, separate from, uh, ontologically distinct from his creation. 
But here's what I believe Scripture points us toward. Here's the mystery that I think it divulges to us in, in places especially like Colossians 1. It says that, you know, I, let me back up just a second. I, I, it just occurred to me not too long ago that that we, uh, we fundamentally, in some respects, we like to think that God created all creation from nothing. That's kind of a basic proposition of classical theology. But what occurred to me is that, to the best of my knowledge, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but the Bible never says that God created from nothing. Now, what am I suggesting? I'm not suggesting that there's this pre-existent and eternal matter that God came up to one day and said, oh, I think I'll make something out of this. No, not at all. That's not at all what I'm saying. But what I, what, this is the main point, is God, the Bible does not say that God created from nothing. But what the Bible does say that I think we're profoundly missing is that the Bible does say that all things are created in Christ. All things are created in Christ. They are created in Him, by Him, and for Him, Colossians 1 tells us. So, that's just something to chew on. What does that mean? And that's what I'm trying to explore. What, what are the implications of the fact that everything that exists in creation exists and is created in Christ? And, Paul goes on to say in Colossians 1, it is constantly, consistently, continually sustained by Christ. He is the very glue, if you will, that, that causes the whole universe to cohere together right now. Again, these are the kind of things we need to think about the Christ who became incarnate, who came and dwelt in our flesh, and who lived and I believe bore our very sinful and fallen nature in his very body. You don't have to believe that, but, but I, I know Karl Barth believed that. The, the Torrance brothers, theologians, believe that. And I think there's something very resonant about him carrying our fallenness, yet never sinning, yet without sin, but carrying it up, bearing it up, as it were, to the cross. I've gotten lost in my thinking because that to me is such a wonderful, fascinating. But this Christ who came and bore our flesh, tabernacled in our flesh and was crucified and buried and was raised on the third day and who ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, this same Christ is the one in whom all creation was created. Stretch your minds, stretch your thoughts, stretch your souls to uh, gaze on this Christ to appreciate who this Christ is. Well, let, let's, uh, uh, well, before I move on, I, I just want to say that I think it's important that, again, it's, I think, an insight, and I believe it proves or it's strong evidence that Lewis himself is drawing from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. There are a couple of things here that to me, to me it's like he had to have gotten that from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, which is our, again, kind of our launching pad into this whole exploration and journey into trying to find and discover what is the mystery of Christ. But, but he says that this magic deeper still is from before time be began. This is the kind of language Paul uses when he's talking about the wisdom hidden in a mystery, and that, it, uh, um, that, it, that it has been hidden for the ages are from the ages. So, uh, you know what? I think maybe I should just end here. Uh, it's 30 minutes already, and of course, I purpose to hope to make a 15 minute, or it, it'd even be better if I could put it all into five minutes. But maybe that's just not possible. But I, I just thank you so much for listening, for taking this time. And uh, I'm just going to stop here, and I will continue on with this presentation next time. There are probably at least a couple of uh, more.
presentations that I want to make kind of along this specific to topic and considering just what uh, Lewis saw, this mystery that Lewis peered into. But then I'm going to, I'm going to end it with uh, something that it, in a way, probably maybe because of the constraints of the fictional metaphor, Lewis couldn't express in the Chronicles of Narnia, but I think there's part of this magic deeper still that that uh, Lewis omitted. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to share that with you maybe in the next, maybe in the one that follows it. I don't know, but pray for me. I really want to be more consistent about this. I want to try not to be perfectionistic and expect, to expect that I've got to get it perfect. Obviously, that's a fool's errand. I know I could never do that. I don't have the intelligence uh, or anything else uh, to be able to do that, apart from maybe a, a miracle. But thank you for listening. Thank you for hanging in there with me. Those, those few of you that have, have stuck with me on this fellowship of the mystery, this journey into the uh, infinite riches hidden in Christ. God bless. Goodbye. See you next time.